just to refer quickly, the, actually one of the, in a sense, the book that Phil was sort of talking about, should you want to go to your local library and ask them to order a copy, um, is called Holdouts, the Los Angeles Poetry Renaissance, 1948-1992. Um, I am an academic, and so this is published by the University of Iowa Press, uh, passing muster with all the MLA types in the, out there in the world. But actually, I'm pretty proud of it. It's probably the book I'm actually best known for. It's a good read. Um, it, uh, despite the fact that I'm an academic, this is written for uh, a general audience. And um, I would, if you're looking for a history of Los Angeles or should some snotty person from San Francisco dare to come down here and say, oh, has anything ever happened down here? You know, this is the kind of book that you want to pull out and say, oh, yeah, have you read this? Uh, no. Well, then come back when you've read it, you know. So, um, ditto, New York. Um, so, tonight I'm going to read a few poems from a, a very odd collection of poems. And, and it's odd because I really didn't pick any of the poems in the book. In fact, I'm trying, I'm trying to remember, um, you know, Vince, this wasn't out, obviously, right? You know, and so, yeah. So this is just, this, yeah, this just came out about a month ago, and it's a very odd collection. And uh, because the poems were picked by my translators, uh, what happened is that I'm one of these, um, like many L.A. poets, underground poets, I, Yes, I teach it at, at a college, but I have a PhD, and that's because I publish articles. I will have an article on Teaching the Beats on a MLA volume that's coming out on Teaching the Beats, you know. So I do the academic dance, and that's how I make my living after working as a typesetter for many years. But I have relatively few books out. One, this was came out in 1982, and this came out in 2006 in a total edition of 250 copies. Uh, there actually isn't a single library in the United States that has a copy of this book, in fact. So, so it's quite a miracle that one day, about four or five years ago, a poet from Mexico happened to wander into Beyond Baroque, and he saw this book and thought, oh, that's an interesting cover. I mean, I don't know why else he would have picked it. <laughs> and he took it home with him along with some other books, and he um, talked to his friend and fellow translator Robin Myers. And together they selected some poems to come out in a book in Mexico. So this book was published in Mexico where apparently I'm better known than here. Uh, this thing actually sold like 700 copies down there, uh, a bestseller by US standards. And um, so this is a bilingual edition that came out in um, Mexico. So just so you understand, that this book, which I will be happy to sell to you tonight for six dollars, okay? It's um, it's that's what it costs me to get copies of it. So you're getting it at cost, and uh, um, so this book says reassembled poems, not selected, right? Because I didn't select them; they were really kind of reassembled by the translators. So just so you understand the book and some of the reason that it's, because you'll be reading it and you'll go, well, I don't read Spanish, I wish there were more poems in English, but this book to me wouldn't exist unless that book had come out before it to sort of encourage it. So I thought, given that we live in California and that so many people here do read Spanish and feel comfortable in it, and I'm glad they do, um, uh, that this is um, a bilingual edition too. Plus you get a chance to Practice your Spanish, right? You know, and learn a few fancy words. Um, so the subtitle, um, right, is um, Los Mananciales del Nirvana, the headwaters of Nirvana. I'm going to start actually with a poem from the very first book that's not in this collection, and in part because of the tragedy that occurred here in terms of the fires. This is a poem that I wrote in Long Beach, California, long before I, back in 19, oh, around 1979, there was a fire in LA and there were ashes. I remember I was standing on a staircase stoop in Long Beach and ashes were floating down in the sky. All right, so, and I wrote this poem, Fire Shadow. 
You put a record on, an eerie fundamental rhythm slash, and I begin to dance alone. You drop your bathrobe on your bed and sink into the tub, dip your hair, then light a candle. Outside, ashes from a mountain fire drift beneath the clouds, and high above the horizon, the sun glows in a red haze. Your front door, kept open by an old iron, cuts a beam in half. The red shadow stretches across the floor and wall. I sink my fingers into it, and then my feet. The shadow trembles and I leap into the bathroom. Behind, the music stops. I strip and step into the tub. Our legs overlap each other's hips. The black wax and rivulets flows down the side of the tub. So, um, I'm going to now move into some poems from that appear here in this collection. And I am going to, uh, Vincent asked, I hope you're, you're he, didn't, he didn't say it directly, but uh, I want you to know, I will read a new piece tonight, Vincent, that I didn't read when we gave our fabulous reading. By the way, you really have a terrific poet in your midst here in terms of Vincent Mallory, and I hope as many of you as possible can go to his, go to his reading. Uh, this is a poem I read when we read together. It's called In the, In the Ocean of Nothingness. Wading into clean, wrinkled laundry, my ironing boards appear with button-down barnacles. The water will be warmer tomorrow. It sloshes around my ankles as I walk between sticky pilings. Hip deep, I finish the sleeves of my third shirt, lean back and float on crescents of disbelief until I sink a little background noise, even in these depths, makes illusions more believable to anyone gazing down. I went for a long swim last night between two tiny continents. The entrails of a transparent fish swayed in mordant harmony Near dawn, it spoke. I am this universe. Its gills rippled like buoyant silk. This next poem is actually my favorite in the collection. It's a very short one. Um, you know, I, I thought about this earlier today. How does, how does one write poems that other people really like? And it's a question that um, I've never really given much thought to. I, I, I don't mean to sound self-absorbed, but I really don't care if you like the poems. I only care, <laughs> I only care if the poem likes the poem. Poems are really selfish, you know. They're really only interested in themselves. They aren't interested in the poet either. They don't care whether I like the poem. The poem only cares if it likes itself. <laughs> but this is a poem that somehow I feel like I, I was given a gift. It's called The Restoration. You cannot grieve for that which snags no name. Without that wounded underbelly, memory cannot commune. Soon the name your friends and lovers savor as the firm edge of wistful voice will vanish. God loves you, say the sermons and the psalms. But he doesn't know my name or yours, any of our names. The grief that he remembers is how no universe can be immortal, not even the one he tried to name, a word that meant the miracle of nothingness. Mm -hmm. 
A lot of poets, of course, uh, end up, even if they hate it when they're young, writing poems about poetry. You know, when I was young, I thought, what a cheap, what a cheap trick. I mean, you're writing a poem, my poem, what's your poem about? My poem's about my poem, right? And I, was, I hated that kind of poem, but eventually you all come around and you start writing poems about poetry and of course the art of poetry, which is the title of this next poem and starts off with a hike in the woods and then shifts the scene. Art of poetry. I wasn't on a path or near a creek or lake, and the deep and the gray light of a smoldering storm, I heard the rotted wood of toppled trees wait for my noise to loosen incandescent spores. Once, hurrying through the thicket of a mountain, I saw a glowing tube of threads like a mash globe, suspended, taut, creased with undulant shadows. A tent caterpillar, a man explained, as sparks from a fire pit decanted. But that name did not suffice. Those syllables only blurred the motionless reverence of the tiny span the chrysalis allowed itself as galactic cusp. The next day, a monk talked of cycles of evasive desire. As he spoke, I rubbed the small tear in a padded finger of the left hand of my motorcycle gloves. I'd hit the pavement hard but jutted back up. No broken bones, no lacerations. I'm easily distracted. Not much chance to escape the sticky wheel of suffering. As he walked past, the monk smiled delightfully, though not at me as such. He had no other blessing to disperse. Yet he had grown up poor, I thought. Those teeth needed work when he was young. The monk was Thich Nhat Hanh, of course, who um, led many in a spiritual resistance to war on all sides, thereby making himself an enemy of both the United States and the North Vietnamese Republic. It's called the winnowing of 47, referring to the birth year of 47, which had a rather strong draw in that particular war. And as part of that war, a part of that effort to reflect on the war, um, I, went to, um, I went to visit the Vietnam Wall um, with my wife, Linda, this, um, several weeks ago. And, um, and certainly that influenced uh, a pro uh, piece that I began working on that I'd been thinking of for some time. So now I've got to find it. So this is a very new piece. And for those of you who know your American literature, you'll recognize some of it as part of Whitman's Song of Myself. And other parts of it you may have heard about, but not as I did not until very recently bothered to look it up online. It's the testimony from the Congressional Committee investigating what happened at My Lai. So this poem is called, it's a complete collage poem, it's called The Accessories. Now I tell what I knew in Texas in my early youth, I tell not the fall of the Alamo, not one escape to tell the fall of Alamo. The hundred and fifty are dumb yet at Alamo, tis the tale of the murder in cold blood of four hundred and twelve young men. I don't understand that term, free fire zone, sir. I have heard it since this thing blew up, but we really didn't talk about these being free fire zones. The main thing is, do they have a weapon? And if it were a military age male that took off running like as fast as he could, they were supposed to catch him. But if it was obviously a military age male and they couldn't catch him, then they were allowed to fire. Retreating, they had formed in a hollow square with their baggage for breastworks. 900 lives out of the surrounding enemies, nine times their number was the price they took in advance. Their colonel was wounded and their ammunition gone. They treated for an honorable capitulation, received writing and seal, gave up their arms and marched back prisoners of war. 
I couldn't foresee any way of, of how the bodies got in the ditch. If they got, got killed by the artillery, when the GIs come through, we usually don't pile up the bodies, but put them in a ditch. We let the Vietnamese, you know, or somebody else come back in and do that. They were the glory of the race of rangers, matchless with horse, rifle, song, supper, courtship, large, turbulent, generous, handsome, proud, and affectionate, bearded, sunburnt, dressed in the free costume of hunters, not a single one over 30 years of age. Did you tell them that we are going to make the village uninhabitable? I do not know, Mr. Congressman, if I use those words. Well, if you told them to burn the hooches and destroy the livestock and plug up the wells, uh, that would almost be the same thing, would it not? It could be interpreted that way, Mr. Congressman, yes, sir. The second first day morning, they were brought out in squads and massacred. It was beautiful early summer. The work commenced about five o'clock and was over by eight. None obeyed the command to kneel. Some made a mad and helpless death rush. Some stood stark and straight. A few fell at once, shot in the temple or heart. The living and dead lay together. The maimed and mangled dug in the dirt. The newcomers saw them there. Some, half killed, attempted to crawl away. These were dispatched with bayonets or battered with the blunts of muskets. A youth not 17 years old seized his assassin till two more came to release him. The three were all torn and covered with the boy's blood. At the time, as I remember, he told me to keep it under, you know, keep it quiet. And I assumed he was talking about this Milai affair. But he was talking about another one that broke later, which we actually tried all the platoon and the lieutenant that were involved. It was an incident where NVA, North Vietnamese Army, nurses were captured and raped all night and then murdered. And the platoon, I think they tried 16 boys, including the lieutenant. At 11 o'clock began the burning of the bodies. This is the tale of the murder of the 412 young men. I just have one other question, Mr. Chairman. It is really not pertinent to this inquiry, but the other atrocity, if you want to use that term, where the lieutenant and his whole platoon were tried for the rape murder of the North Vietnamese nurses, in what area did this occur? I think the Quezon Valley's area, which was north of My Lai. It was a very active area. And I only put it in on the fringe of it because it happened in June. One of the things, of course, you realize about Women's Poem and his evocation of this massacre that occurred in the 1830s was that he's really trying to justify, of course, the U.S.-Mexican War. Right, they did this to that, to us, you know, we must return the favor kind of thing. Or as the great poet, late Tom, Tom Lux puts it, they do this, we do that. So, um, in reading that longer poem, I realized that um, I, it took up a great deal of uh, my allotted time. So, but I really wanted to share something new. Um, it's um, and something I think that is pertinent to what is occurring in this country right now. So that's something that you've, you were the first to hear it. You can, always, uh, you can always say that you were the first to hear something from this project, um, uh, and at least in terms of that piece right there. That's it. And uh, I'm going to close with one of the things, with two little short pieces. One is an old poem that I rarely read in public, but which has something to do with kind of what I'm getting more interested in right now. It's a poem called McVicker's Garden, and it's called A Portrait in McVicker's Garden, and then I'll close with a very short piece. Portrait in McVicker's Garden. Uh, Jim McVicker is a landscape and uh, still life painter. He lives up in Eureka, Lolita area. If you ever had a chance to see his work, it's really top notch. My face cannot be finished. Two days I've stared and slouched near cusp of dahlias, foxgloves creamed with red, my chest and shoulders swelling in a dark shirt, jeans trenched between white petals as each slides an edge under another's wavering fan of points. 
It's not working, he says, lifting the canvas off. As I kneel on a narrow stone path, the wetness of mud seeps through my pants, sipping up my thighs. A big hat darkens my chin. Yellow, piano, yellow peonies uncoil. A leaf isn't smooth, but puckers from edge to spinal thread. Light scuffs the repetition until color roughens. Lilac squats, orange puffs, yellow crouches increase gourds, thick husk of amber, shrill asperities, stretch grays, pinks, pinks, ziggurats, lips pardoned, parted for your garden's kiss. I'd forgotten that I could actually sort of write a lyrical poem. <laughs> nice. So, um, I'm going to close with the final piece that's going to be at the end of this long sequence um, in which, um, do I have a couple more minutes, Phil? So I wanna share with you, in fact, just so that uh, something that maybe you'll see if, if you go to the Vietnam Wall, when Linda and I went to visit the Vietnam Wall, I'd never been to it before. And it was a personal thing. I knew um, one person, uh, I went to a real small high school, whose name was on the wall. And you remember that poem that um, I started the evening with, uh, the one, Fire Shadow. Her brother was killed in Vietnam, Robert J. Annetti. His name is on the wall, too. Um, but one of the things that struck me about the wall that I hadn't, hadn't really ever heard people talk about, and that is, you know, the wall is set up so it's like this, right? And, and in a sense, there's a crease where that wall is, and from the right, all the names are listed in the order in which they died. So you had the very first soldier that died, and the piece ends with, uh, of course, the infamous position as John Kerry, who wants to be the last soldier killed in this war? And that person's name is last there. Well, one of the things that I've never heard anybody talk about is that all the names as you look at the right-hand wall, so to speak, if you're facing it center, are flush left. So they're all pushing at this center point. When you look at the other wall, they're flush right, which means that they're moving once again towards that center. In other words, the names are kind of moving towards that center point. And when you're standing there and you realize how high that center point is, it's rather like the prow of a ship. In other words, like D.H. Lawrence's ship of death. And we are the sailors working with this cargo of memory. I mean, the, the, the sculpture really is metaphorical. It's not, not just a, a wall. It really becomes like the hull of a ship. So I'm going to close with Gravestone Song. I have done what I was sent here to do. Fraught with errors I could not subdue. And sour and sweet, almost complete. I regret that it's time to say adieu. So, like Saturn with his many moons, please leave me here to soothe my wounds. For the people at Borderline, too, of course. Thank you all very much for being here tonight. Truly, thank you. Thank you.